Hey everybody, Taryn the Traveling Trainer here on GoTaren TV. Welcome to episode 499. We're going to be welcoming Mr. Dan Magnus back here on GoTaren TV all the way from Los Angeles, California. So it's going to be very special. You don't want to miss it. And he'll be on here in a minute. But before we bring him on, what makes this episode even more especially special is that we also have the new co-host of GoTaren TV right here in Atlanta, Georgia, Ms. Di Chapman. She's going to be side by side right next to me here as we talk to Dan Magnus all the way from L.A., so you don't want to miss that. And again, I'm excited because this is kind of like a you know, soft opening, kind of an informal, casual welcoming to Die being the co-host on GoTerran TV. But don't go away because, again, when we come back, she's going to be here with me as we talk to Dan Magnus from Los Angeles, California. Hey everybody, welcome to Go Taren TV today. It's episode 499, and I'm Taren the Traveling Trainer out of Atlanta, Georgia. Side by side, we're going to be having Ms. Diane Chapman join us here, who's also from Atlanta, Georgia, via Skype. And on the line right now, all the way from Los Angeles, California, we've got someone returning back on Go Taren TV via audio podcast, Mr. Dan Magnus, a kickboxing champion of the world, a gentleman who's had an inspiring story here on GoTerran TV after two open heart surgeries, winning the kickboxing championship. So, uh, Dan, welcome back to GoTerran TV. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Well, um, you know, since we had you last on here, for anybody who missed out, uh, it was back in March. Uh, for references' sake, they can go back to episode 453. And uh, here we are today. Uh, I guess before Di joins us, let me just jump right in, Dan, and ask you um, about the Afterglow cruise because I know you got Roxy there next to you. And uh, tell us, uh, how was it? Oh, so she doesn't hit me with a baseball bat. Uh, <laughs> it was a great cruise. It was amazing how many of these fans are so in line and in touch with Glow. Okay. I mean, you're talking 30 years uh, Glow's been off the air, and you would think it's on right now. Yeah. I mean, these fans, plus the fans... Uh, got a whole different perspective of, of the Glow Girls. Mm-hmm. Because nobody ever, uh, you know, most of wrestlers or even boxers or kickboxers don't interact with their fans. You know, they'll do autographs and, you know, things and that. But at this cruise, all they did was interact. Wow. It was like one big family. It was crazy. And I'm used to, you know, fans and stuff like that. And I'm not very a very social person. But to see all these glow girls uh, interacting with these fans and these fans actually, you know, loving them, mm-hmm. you know, not, and not like, you know, a star worship thing. The girls made all the fans feel like they're part of the family, which yeah. is really, really, I haven't seen that. That is that so really cool. uh, interesting. Yeah, that is really cool, Dan. And. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, that's a really good segue here. Uh, Di, uh, I want you to meet Dan uh, Magnus. We've got him on the line right now. Dan, here's uh, Di Chapman. And uh, Dan was just coming back from the uh, Afterglow fan cruise. Um, Dan, I think you could maybe fill in Di and uh, tell her about um, the... Uh, I may, maybe you, let's step back a little bit. Can you talk to her and tell her about the uh, gorgeous ladies of wrestling and then segue into, uh, you know, how you got connected with them, I guess, to start out with. Di, can you hear Dan okay? I can. Oh, Hi, perfect. Dan. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very excited about talking with you. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, people don't like to talk to me <laughs> because I'm usually neither arresting them or I'm beating them up. <laughs> so they don't really like talking to me so much. <laughs> well, this is great. I'm so happy to uh, introduce you both. And uh, Di, before you got on, I was just telling him about uh, Beth Sandin and uh-huh. her story and then yeah. vice versa. I was mentioning to Dan that I uh, filled you in on uh, how he overcame adversity and was able to you know, accomplish what he did. So uh, I guess that's a good segue right there into just uh, introducing you both. And um, I was explaining to Dan that you know, we'll let uh, you basically co-host on here and uh, okay. lead the way. So, uh, Dan, if you would please, um, yeah, maybe just uh, in a couple of sentences or whatnot, um, you know, if you could tell Di uh, and fill her in. And for the folks who maybe didn't get a chance to listen to your podcast last time, 
um, maybe wrap summarize um, you know what we talked about and uh, you know where you're at right now. Okay. Uh, should I just start or yeah, you please, ask sure, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, like I you know uh, said in the early one, uh, I'm the only professional athlete ever to come back after not one but two open heart surgeries. Mm-hmm. My first heart surgery was in '83. It was done, and I was hit by a car and oh. broke my ribs, and one of my ribs punctured my heart. Hmm. Oh. And I didn't know it. And I didn't know it. And in 83, after my ribs healed, I went to go fight in Atlantic City, and during the pre-fight physical, the doctor, who had happened to be a cardiologist, but he was a ringside doctor, heard a heart murmur. And he, he's done me a ton of times before in my other fights and said, I've never heard this coming from it. It's a loud heart murmur. Mm. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, no, you never had this before. Uh, this is really loud. It's really bad. I don't know what it's from. You know, it can't be congenital because I never heard it before, and it's too loud. Mm. So I said, okay, what's that mean? He goes, I can't let you fight. And I got so mad because I was in great shape and I was <laughs> fighting. I grabbed him. I grabbed him by the tie. I was choking him. I mean, <laughs> I got, almost got in so much trouble. And then I went to a bunch of doctors uh, because of who I was, and nobody could really figure out what was wrong with me. One doctor who was a big-name cardiologist in Jersey, I drove all the way to Jersey, and he just told me, oh, you were born with it. And it's like, but they never heard it before. But, you know, he wrote a book, so he just thought he was the greatest thing since French toast. <laughs> and finally, one of my black belts uh, was a, uh, a doctor at NIH and said, you know, you work for the government, they'll, they'll love to experiment on you because NIH is a, an experimental hospital. You know, so uh, the government decided to check me out and see, and when they did all the tests on me, uh, they found out I had a rip in my aortic valve. My gosh. And oh. so when they said they had a rip, uh, there's a couple of things we can do. You don't have to do anything, and you're doing fine right as it is. Someday you might have to have open heart surgery, but your fight career and everything else is done. And I went, well, what are the other options? They go, well, we don't really know. I have any other options. I go, well, I want to fight again. They said, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. And I said, why not? And they didn't have an answer for me. So the Dr. McIntosh, who was the head of the cardiac surgery, said, well, you know, we can always try to repair it. We've never repaired it before. And again, because it's a government hospital and they're paying for everything, I'm not paying anything. Basically, I'm a guinea pig. So they just went crazy, you know, okay, we can experiment on an athlete. So I I agreed to the surgery. I said, well, will I be able to fight again? They said, we'll see. To me, that was a yes. We'll see was just a yes. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, when I had the surgery, uh, 10 months later, I fought for the uh, title and won it. In fact, the... Boxing commission at the time wouldn't let me wouldn't let me fight, and I had to bring all my my surgeon team. They got their way paid to Atlantic City, sitting front row at my main event, you know, uh, because they overruled the boxing commission, which was really kind of funny because you're watching. Here's a team of surgeons in the front row watching me fight. Like if something happens to me, what are they going to do? Surgery in the ring? Mm. They thought it was the most Probably. ridiculous thing in the world. Probably, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so basically I had to convince my doctors that I was fine, and they just watched me. One day they came in about eight, about six to seven months after my heart surgery. They came in to watch me train, and they were watching me spar and do all the stuff and working out like crazy, and they said, we feel sorry for the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, we'll allow you to fight. And I fought, and I won, and I kept going. And then I retired in 88, and then I made a comeback in 93. And uh, when I was fighting for the world title for a uh, third time, I wanted to win the title. I started feeling sick. This was in 1993. I was living in Hawaii, and I started feeling sick. I thought I had the flu, and this was before the, the fight. But I went to do it anyway, and the day of the fight, uh, I didn't feel right. You know, I was congested, and I was, I thought maybe, you know, I had a cold or something, but uh, I was in congestive heart failure, and I didn't oh know it. Oh, my gosh. 
Whoa. So uh, we went to fight, and in the first round, he hit me with a right hand and dropped me. And I've never been dropped before. Mm. And I got up and beat the count. And when I sat down for the second round, I was breathing really hard. And we went out for the second round, and I knocked him down. Uh, and when I came back to start to get ready for the third round, I was breathing like it was. I went 15. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I stood up when the bell rang for the third round, took three steps, and we touched gloves, and I passed out in the ring. I just fell down. It looked like I took a dive. Uh, yeah. And Whoa. they counted me out. They thought it was a delayed reaction from me getting knocked down in the first round. And he won the title. So after it was done, they checked me out and they said, uh, this murmur is really loud. And it was stopped when they had the, uh, when I had the surgery fixed. So, uh, I had to fly all the way to Washington DC again. And they did the, uh, all the tests again and said, you ripped it open again. And it's ripped open so bad that we can't fix it. So now you got three choices. You can have a pig valve, but the only problem is the pig valve is tissue, oh. so it'll it'll die out in about seven years, and you'll have to have a third surgery. Oh. You can get a cadaver valve, which is a dead tissue valve. That'll last about 10 years, maybe, and you'll have to have another surgery. Or you can have a metal valve, and it's called a St. Jude's mechanical valve. That'll last forever, but you'll be on a blood thinner. You'll be on Coumadin for the rest of your life. And all I said to him was, can I fight again? And they're like, what's with you in the fighting? <laughs> so I, I agreed to have the metal valve and take my chances with the cumin in. And then uh, I had the, third, the, the second surgery, which was a rough surgery. I died twice on the table. Oh. And uh, it was really, really bad. Uh, it took oh. like eight hours that when they came in, they told my wife at the time and the rest of my family that... Uh, Listen, this surgery went like three hours longer than it should. He's in intensive care. Uh, it's 10.30 at night. If he doesn't wake up by 10.30, 11 tomorrow morning, there's a problem. Oh. And I woke up about 4.30 in the morning. In fact, when I woke up, the ICU was dark and all those bright red lights. And you got to remember, I'm still all, all hooked up on stuff. I looked like a Star Trek convention, but it was really dark with all these red lights. I thought it was in hell. So I sat up and I pulled my breathing uh, device out of my mouth, out of my throat. And the nurse is trying to put it back in. And the doctor comes in and says, what are you doing? And he goes, he pulled the breathing tube out. He goes, well, he's breathing, so leave him alone. <laughs> and they go, just give him a shot and calm him down. So... Uh, they gave me a shot, and then about 8 o'clock, they said, you know what, he's fine. I mean, he ripped the thing out. He's eating. Just put him in a room. The only thing is they didn't tell my family and all that. They came to the ICU, and I wasn't there. So they thought I died. Oh. Oh. And they come in. So they go, no, no, no. We, he woke up early this morning, so we put him in another room, a regular room. And they walk in, and they were mad at me. I was watching television. I was so high on drugs. <laughs> I was watching Animaniacs that I can't even watch it now. I cannot watch Animaniacs because that song gets stuck in my head. <laughs> you know, when you're on, on all that medication for the pain, they're like, they give it to you. They don't even tell you. And you're, and they have a, you're laying in bed and you're watching a screen. You know, and you're like, okay. So, you know, and then I came back and uh, I did a, an exhibition fight to see if I was in shape uh, for Chuck Norris's Kick Drugs Out of America. I did a 60-round exhibition fight with 10 different oh. people. And I fought 62-minute rounds. And oh. it's pretty funny how I got involved in the pro wrestling. The last 10 rounds, I was friends with a guy named Eric Bischoff, who ran World Championship Wrestling, which was the competitor for the WWE. And he got his... Uh, one of my black belts gave him a black belt, and he was in charge of the wrestling. And they were in town during my exhibition fight. So when I talked to him, he said, why don't you just, the last 10 rounds, I'll bring some wrestlers in and you'll, you know, kickbox with them because they had some wrestlers that, you know, were saying they were kickboxing things. And I went, you know, so we just, it was a, a light sparring thing, but the last 10 rounds I'm sparring wrestlers that are 260 and I'm 180. Mm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then the last round, 
the last round was with Eric Bischoff himself, which was a big because he was on television and everything. And uh, while we're going through the last round, Eric goes to me, kick me in the head, and I'm going to take a dive for you. And I went, what? Oh. I'm too tired. And he goes, no, just kick me. So I threw a kick in his head, and he took a bump, which is a fall, and the referee thought I really knocked him out. And the crowd went crazy, and we raised over $20,000 for Kick Drugs Out of America. That's great. And that, so, that's great. you know, and then, I got, and then I got into the wrestling business. I started uh, teaching professional wrestling because it's not rocket science. They try to make it like it is, it's, but it's, uh, I think being a kickboxer is harder because if someone's really trying to knock you out. In uh, wrestling, it's mm. really hard, much harder than people think because you're fighting and not trying to hurt each other. And that's more difficult in a way. You know, uh, it's a mm. chance of getting hurt a lot faster. So, uh, you know, it just depends on how much you love what you're doing, you know, how far you can go. Well, I think you're absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It's just your story is incredible. Mm -hmm. It really is. And so, you know, when I think about um, professional athletes like yourself, something occurs to me that you guys are good at whatever you put your mind to. So whatever, I remember too from Taryn's earlier interview with you, weren't you also a pro skater when you were young, ice yeah. skater? Your dad? No, I was a roller skater. Roller? I was oh, a roller my. Skater. Oh, that's I was a, a roller. I was a roller skating figure skating champion. It oh, was my. pretty funny. Uh, my mom and dad were, uh, were champion skaters, and I've been skating since I was like two, three years old. I, I could skate before I could walk almost. And I got in the competition when I was like five or six, and so I did skating uh, till I was seventeen years old. I started martial arts when I was thirteen. I got my black belt uh, when I was fifteen, and then when I was seventeen, I just didn't want to do it anymore. And I skated one more time for uh, I won, uh, you know, twice, and the last time was just to you know I did it basically. You know, just uh, one more time for my father. Right. You know, because he would have a three-time like champion. And then I put my oh. skates in the garbage and never touched them. My mother pulled them out of the garbage and kept them. But I haven't had skates on since I was seventeen. If I put skates on now, I'd probably kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I, all I know is when I used roller skates, I tore up the knees in a lot of pants. And I didn't oh. even know that was what, you know how you, you tear everything when you fall? It's just awful. Yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, with ice skating, you know, it's funny. Roller skaters can't ice skate, and ice skaters can't roller skate. Yeah, exactly. I, I was friends with Dorothy Hamill, oh. and I once went ice skating with her, which made me feel like an idiot, because I, <laughs> I looked like one of these people that couldn't, <laughs> couldn't move. But then I took her roller skating, and she looked like me. She couldn't do it. There's a girl that's doing all these jumps and spins and on television, she couldn't roller skate. It's a to totally different thing. Yes, you know? I, I know. Yeah. I agree with that. I definitely agree with I, I couldn't. I, I skated as a child a lot. And when I went on roller skates, I was absolutely an idiot. I think I spent more time on the ground than I did on the skates. Yeah. I've hit the ground kind of hard. I think that's why I became a fighter. And it was hard to, to beat me because I took so much punishment on my own. Yeah. You know, nothing is harder than the floor. Yeah. Well, now, what are you up to today? What are you doing? Well, what I do now is I do seminars uh, on personal protection. Ah. Uh, I've, I've been a, a fugitive recovery person for the government. I've... Uh, huh? Worked. I work. You know, when they have people they want that are wanted, they sent me and my partner to get them. Oh. We didn't have to search for them. Well, we did, but we basically knew where they were. We just brought them back. Now you got to remember, this was the eighties. Oh. Uh, it was a lot easier back then to bring people, you know, across state lines or countries uh, without getting your picture taken and being put on the internet. <laughs> there wasn't an internet. You know, a little harder to find them. Now it's totally reversed. It's really easy to find them, but to catch them is so ridiculous. You can't do it. 
Well, they would certainly know who you are from watching the internet, yeah. right? They would know your yeah. photo and what you were doing because people yeah, just so, you know, it's, it's totally changed now. Yeah. But now what I'm basically doing is is like personal protection, which is different than self defense. Hmm. Personal protection is learning to be aware. You know, going to a restaurant and looking to see where the exits are, looking at the people around there. Does somebody, you know, look funny? I mean, right after the uh, Florida uh, oh. shootings, mm -hmm. uh, oh. Roxy and me went to a Denny's, and we went in the Denny's, and when we sit, sat down, and she sat with her back to the door, and I sat with my uh, me looking at the door, you know, because that's just the way I do, and I grabbed the ketchup, squeezer you know those ketchup bottles that are plastic that you squeeze the ketchup out oh yeah i took that and put it at the edge of the, of the table and roxy goes to me what are you doing i said well if somebody comes in here with a gun i'll just squirt the ketchup in their face so i can get to them and she goes only you can <laughs> i had the ketchup the mustard and a glass of water yeah. ready to hit somebody as they came in i mean it was really this is how yeah. i think very ingenious. Mm -hmm. You're right. I, I I don't know that I would have ever thought of that. Yeah. You know, what it is is the whole idea of personal protection is to get away. Mm -hmm. Not to beat the guy up, not to, uh, you know, attack him and beat him to death. It's to hit him, stun him, make him his own self-preservation kick in so you can get away. If I squirt you in the face with ketchup, you're going to rub your eyes, it's going to burn, and while you're doing that, I run away. You're not going to chase me. Mm -hmm. You're too busy worrying about yourself. You know, mm -hmm. it's like the same things like Mace would be. But the only problem with Mace is a little wind, Mace will hit you too. Ooh. I've sprayed Mace on people. Ooh. And I get, even though I sprayed a person with Mace, I'll get hit by it. Oh, my. Because it, go, it clouds in the air. So, you know, it, it's not exactly the greatest weapon in the world. You know, but here, here's the thing, like Pulse, you know, had 300 people in there, 300, you know, guys, because it was a gay club, mm -hmm. and a guy walks in and shoots, why didn't any, if, if all 300 would have jumped on him, maybe two or three people would have got shot, they would have taken him down. But that's mm -hmm. a human thing, we, we, you know, we get scared, and when we get scared, it's fight or flight, and most of the time it's flight. Mm -hmm. And the thing that people don't understand about that situation, they said, how do you get into the club with an AR-15, which is, a, you know, assault rifle mm -hmm. and guns? Because I used to run nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And when I ran, I was the only white guy in Denver that ran a hip-hop club, oh. which was pretty funny. <laughs> Here I am in a long leather coat, long hair, and I'm running a hip-hop club. <laughs> And everybody thought I had, like, a machine gun under my, my jacket. <laughs> but we used, we used to have everybody get patted down. I used to have female guards to pat the women down and look in their purses because they're the ones that usually bring the guns into a, a club. Mm. Now, the thing that people don't understand is at a, a gay club, there are no pat-downs. Mm. Oh, they, seriously? All gay clubs don't do that because they don't really suspect uh, anyone who's gay that's going to do that. So, and from what I heard, this guy's been there five or six times, so they knew him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he thought yeah. he was gay, and, you know, nobody thinks that they're going to do it. So they're much easier and free from because your regular, uh, everyday person is not going to go to those clubs. So usually who's going to go there, you know, they're going there and to have a good time and hook up and whatever. Then no one patted him down. So he probably, they saw him before. He had a long coat on, you know, or something, and they just said, okay, go in. Maybe they checked his ID, but they didn't check him for weapons because they don't do that. Mm. Those clubs don't do that. They'll do it now, mm. but they don't do it, and it's because they never had to. Hmm. It's just like getting on an airplane now. You don't need uh, air marshals on planes. Every person that buys a ticket's an air marshal. Because hmm. if anybody stands up and says they're taking over the plane, you got 125 passengers that are going to kill them because they all think mm -hmm. they're dead anyway. Where before, you were on a plane and someone said, I'm taking over the plane, you just thought you were being hijacked and going to another uh, place. Mm -hmm. But after 9-11, now mm -hmm. we found out everybody's an air marshal. Mm -hmm. So it's just now a whole thing of being 
a lot more aware of your situation. And it's harder now because everybody's got their face buried in their cell phone, Roxy. <laughs> she's got a, a brand new, she's got one of these, what is that phone? It's a smartphone, smarter than her. <laughs> she never, ever, ever takes her face away from it. I've never seen a, I've never been with a person that, she's on it now. You know, she's hardly listening to me. I'm talking to you on a flip phone. I'm on a flip phone. You know, one of those $5 flip phones. You text me, I will call you while you're texting me and say, what do you want? You're like, I texted you. I know. What do you want? Well, did you read the text? If I read the text, I wouldn't be calling you. What do you want? It's called a phone. If I wanted a typewriter, a small typewriter, I'd get on a typewriter. Okay? I can answer your your question right now if we're talking. You're normally the, the answer is no, but, you know, talk to me. When you go back and forth on this email, sometimes I get, you know, Facebook people write me, and I'll go, yeah, good. Okay. And they keep asking me questions. I'm like, Look, this is my phone number. Call me. <laughs> and there are people out there that go, well, I, that's the problem. You know, we're losing working, talking to people, losing our communication skills. Because there are, there are people that will text each other and they're sitting next to each other. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what? Can you, you know, say, that's the way it's gone. Can you say millennials? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Taryn. You're not... <laughs> Terribly above that, I don't think. But <laughs> yeah, oh no, I know. So many of them are sitting at the table and they're texting. And you're right. It's there is such a communication lack now. But how do you think that affects everyone when they get on the plane? Mm. You were saying everybody's got their face and their cell phone. Does that actually affect how we are when we get on an airplane as far as our attentiveness mm. to something well, that could happen? Yeah, it's gotten so bad that even if you're on a plane, you can't talk to anybody or text if you're up too high until, you know, Wi-Fi kicks in. But they got <laughs> the computers, they got this and that, and everybody's heads down. And it's like, you know, if a guy had a gun and on a plane with a silencer, half the people, three quarters of the people wouldn't even know what's going on. <laughs> you know, so, but, and it's not going to get any better. Hmm. You know, you know, like I teach in my seminars, you already have... A, I can turn anything into a weapon. Hmm. And that, uh, and I say to these people, you always have a weapon in your hand, your cell phone. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And they go, I go, if the guy comes at you, just hit him with your cell phone. But I might break my cell phone. Oh. Okay. <laughs> then buy another cell phone. Oh. You know, it's okay. just the way people are. Wow. You know? You know what? That's that's that itself is very scary, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. seriously scary. Mm -hmm. And they here's the other thing. And what do you think about this? I know that from the documentaries I've seen, the biggest risk now of someone getting on the plane and attempting a hijack or attempting something not so great is if you're traveling in another country and you're getting on the plane okay. in another country. Mm. Yeah, that's only because they don't they don't have well now they're changing because of what happened, you know, in the other countries because they never they did two things about the other countries. They're used to terrorists. Mm. You know, sure. Europe has had terrorists, sure. you know, problems for centuries. We mm. haven't. You know, besides Pearl Harbor uh, 9-11 was the first time we ever got attacked on our own soil, mm -hmm. which is not really true because uh, Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City right. bombing oh. thing. But right. He was a homegrown. Mm -hmm. He was. He wasn't, he, uh, like, yep. yes. he wasn't a terrorist people, like we People think. don't think about that. He was an actually American homegrown boy. Mm -hmm. and a lot right. of people He had nothing to do with being it. Muslim. He had nothing to do with it. Right. Mm -hmm. He had right. nothing to do with it. He was with a white supremacy group. Yes. Mm. You know, yes. And that the interesting about thing about that because uh, I was me and my partner because you know we're what we call for the government worst case scenario instructors, mm. and that's what I do with my personal. Friend. I can think of the worst. They come to me and go, Dan, this is what we're going to do. Think of the worst case scenario that's going to happen to us, so we can figure out how to get out of it. Mm. It's, I, cool. you know, when you're a worst case scenario instructor, people do not like you really. 
They'll go, oh, we're going to have a good time. Yeah, but if this, 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 this happens, they're like, well, you just ruined that buzz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about Timothy McVeigh, you know how they found out about him? When he blew up the building, the other building across the street from the one that got blown up had all the windows shattered from the concussion of the blast. Mm-hmm. But the building they blew up was concaved in. So only mm. one side blew, but the noise blew the windows out. And when we got there, that's how they knew this wasn't a, you know, a foreign terrorist. This was a homegrown terrorist because the bomb that, I don't know how he did it, created from a U-Haul thing was like a Claymore mine. Huh. If you know anything about explosives, a Claymore mine was made in Vietnam. It actually would say on the Claymore mine, this side forward. I could put it down in front of me, pull the button, it'll kill everybody in front of me, but won't hurt me because it only blows one way. Oh, that's how, so that's how so that's how he was well, not injured or killed in yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, it, and that's an Amer- only Americans uh, use Claymore mines. Mm. Oh, sure. The others use uh, our suicide bombers, but Americans yeah. don't want yeah, to do that just, to themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's just, you know, listen, you know, shootings and terrorism has been, like I said, going on for centuries. Mm-hmm. It's just now because of the Internet and all the other ways, you know, social media, mm-hmm. we know about it. There were mass shootings in the 70s. If you lived in New York and there was a mass shooting in California, uh, people in New York didn't know and didn't care. Hmm. You know, now a dog will take a crap in Afghanistan in a yard and it's on CNN. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, my goodness. You know, so, oh my goodness. you know, the world's changed mm-hmm. and news people love, you know, putting it, but look at it. Someone dies and it's a big thing and then two days later someone else dies and forget about the person. The other person that died, when China, the wrestler, died, it was a big, big thing. Only thing is, she got upstaged by Prince, who died the next day. Hmm. And right. no one even heard about China. No one even found out about China or anything because it was too busy about Prince. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. who both of them died of the same thing, a drug overdose. Mm. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, my goodness. I knew Prince did, but you're right. I yeah. hadn't heard about China, the wrestler. China did, yeah. China did, the reason why no one knew about China dying of it, because when they put it out, they were still talking about Prince. Ah. Yeah. Hmm. Now, she got upstaged by Prince. So this was a, a female wrestler. Right. She was the, oh. uh, she was called the ninth wonder of the world. Really? She was a big like, bodybuilder type wrestler, and she was big in the 90s, and then, uh, you know, she had a, a bad falling out, <laughs> excuse me, with the WWE, and uh, it, she fell apart. I bodyguarded her a couple times, and she was a mess. She was an alcoholic. Mm. She was on celebrity rehab. She went to Japan to straighten her life out, and she became a teacher. She taught English because she can speak, or she could speak fluid Japanese. So for about two years, she was a teacher in Japan. Huh. Then she came back here, and I don't know what happened to her, but uh, she fell apart, hmm. you know, and she, you know, overdosed. She took too much or whatever she took and died in her sleep. Oh, goodness. You know, you know, so, you know, just that's what things happen. You know, they watch these people on television or they watch everything, and they, they get this idea that they're superhuman, but they're human beings like everybody else. Everybody's got their flaws. Everybody's got their pains, and it's hard. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been through. I, you know, besides my open heart surgeries, I've been. I have twenty one trauma induced injuries. I've been shot. I've been stabbed. You know, and I know what exactly it's mm-hmm. like to just come back and recover all the time. Mm-hmm. And my attitude is, as long as I'm breathing, I'll go for whatever I want to go for. And it's hard sometimes. Sometimes you just want to give up. You just want to say. Oh, the hell with this, but I don't know what that means. Hmm. You know, I don't know how to stop anything. I can just, if I have something in my head I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. And when I met Roxy, she's worse than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when that girl says she's going to do something, I, I just stay out of the way. You know, people go, 
how do you put up with it? I stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that um, determination to not give up when you have something that you really want to do, mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that separates someone like you, mm-hmm. a professional, at uh, the things that you've done. And that's the difference between you and us because it's so easy for us to decide we're going to give up if we don't reach a certain point at a, of a goal. Hmm. We just go, well, dang, okay, I'll do, you know, I'll just go out and uh, eat lunch. I mean, we just don't know how to say, I'm going to keep going on this. So many of us. Well, I shouldn't say we well, all There's a big difference between you and us it, that way. Yeah. Well, it's a thing of fight or flight. And mm-hmm. I'm a fighter. You know, I you know I know when to take flight when I have to. Like, it's really funny. You know, I bodyguard. And basically, I put my life on the line for the people that are paying me to protect them. You know, but if I'm not getting paid and I see something bad's going to happen, I'm out of there. I'm the first one out. People will go, uh, oh, good, we're safe. Dan's here. Uh, unless you're paying Dan, if something bad is happening, Dan's leaving. <laughs> Dan's not going to stay there and save the day. I'm not a superhero. Now, <laughs> you pay me, then I'll do it. I'll tell you a funny story. I was with one time in Washington, D.C., having dinner at this restaurant a, a friend of mine owned. And I was having dinner with my girlfriend at the time and... A fight started in this thing. Two guys started fist fighting, and they're clearing the tables and everything. And I'm just sitting there with her, and I'm eating. And the owner comes up to me and goes, Dan, can you stop it? I go, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> he, went, he went, what? What? I go, uh, you want me to stop this? You pay me. If not, I'm just finishing my meal. And I, so it's like, you know, and if he touches me, I'll kill both of them. <laughs> you know, and they stayed away from us. And he goes, "Dan, I thought you'd help." I go, "No, I get paid to help." <laughs> you know, you pay me. <laughs> yeah, so it, you know, there's different degrees of what people do. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing that I think is really fascinating that you know is the psychology of the fight or flight. How we respond to things that look like they could hurt us and how to protect ourselves. These are not just things that we think of, and yet you do, and you see the psychology of it. And I think well, most of us, you know, most of us don't. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. People don't understand. You know, when I do seminars and all that, or people see me, they go, God, I don't want to be like you. You're not scared of everything, of anything. I go, what, are you kidding me? I'm scared of everything. Hmm. I am scared of everything. I just know how to deal with it. Mm. I get scared like everybody. I have a thing. People know when I'm aware or alert on something, I get real quiet. And my eyes almost like turn black. Hmm. Even Roxy goes, I've seen that look. It's scary. But I basically don't say anything. And people go, how come when you get, you know, when something bad is going to happen, you hardly talk or you whisper? I'll whisper to people, you've got to stop. And I, because my voice cracks because I get scared. Hmm. So I've learned to whisper so my voice doesn't crack so it doesn't sound like I'm scared. Hmm. I'm usually scared. Out of my, you know, it's adrenaline. Anyone who tells you they're not scared, they're crazy. They're crazy. There's something wrong with them hmm. if they're not scared. Yeah. And that's the thing about, the, like, suicide bombers. They're not scared of hmm. dying. They are... Because there's certain things that people don't understand. They just don't blow themselves up so they can be with whoever they want to be with, you know, whatever their religion thing is. Uh, it's got to be done a certain way. Hmm. If it's not done a certain way and they're not going to think get what they think they're going to get in the afterlife, they won't do it. You know, and it's just like you said, the psychology, you know, of learning to protect yourself. You know, and I've been in all kinds of combat sports you know, between kickboxing, boxing, and professional wrestling. Professional wrestling is a combat sport. You know, it's not choreographed, but it's talked out, but they're still hitting each other. You're still in a confrontation. It's just, you know, you know who the winners and losers are, but those guys are in better shape than most fighters, real fighters. 
Hmm. So yes. they do it all the time, you know. But they fear too. Mm-hmm. I've been in bars with uh, some of the biggest wrestlers that were like the scariest, like the Road Warriors. Mm-hmm. We were in a bar once, and a little guy asked one Road Warrior animal, who's one of the, you should see this guy. He's huge. If you ever get the time? Uh, Google the Road Warriors in wrestling. These guys look like two monsters. They're like six foot three, six foot four, almost three hundred pounds mm-hmm. of muscle. Mm. Well, Animal sitting there and gave the guy an autograph. This guy must have been about like five foot nine, maybe a hundred and fifty pounds, and he was drunk. And Animal signed a, a thing for him and gave it to him. And the guy goes, "Let me buy you a drink." And Animal goes, "No, thank you very much." And the guy slapped him in the head. <laughs> slapped Animal in the head like you disrespected me. <laughs> Animal, I thought was going to eat him. <laughs> but Animal got up and said, I can't believe you did that. And then I had to take the guy outside because I thought Animal was going to kill him. And then when I came back, Animal goes, I can't believe he did that to me. I'm like, I'm amazed you didn't kill him. He goes, hey, that guy scared the daylights. I mean, if he had the guts to hit me, maybe he would have shot me. Mm. So, mm. you know what? Everybody, you know, the only thing about pro wrestling is, you know, they're characters. Mm-hmm. The, people, the characters they portray is not who they really are. You know, sometimes some of the wrestlers think they are, but then you really think the Undertaker is the undead? Hmm. You really think John Cena is a thug? <laughs> <laughs> you really think Roxy Astor is a Park <laughs> Avenue knockout? <laughs> she about hit me with a bat. <laughs> I wondered about that. I've always wondered how choreographed that um, sport is, especially. They're not, chore- in not choreographed. Yeah, it's not choreographed. Oh, it's it's improvised. Oh, there's set there's set moves that everybody knows and routines, but they talk through it during the match. They talk to each other. Oh, okay, I'm going to do this. this. Because I've wrestled before, and there's times I've gotten there, and the guy I'm wrestling, I'm like, I've grabbed them. Whenever you see them holding a lot, they're resting. and Or if they got their heads close together, the guy's whispering in his ear, I forgot what we're doing. What are we doing next? <laughs> and, and the referee is mic'd to the back, so he knows exactly how much time there is. And when we hit the ground and we look like we're, you know, all stunned, the referee will, one, go, you okay to see if we're all right, and two, say, you got five minutes left. You know, so he's cueing us. It's a, it's a, a routine, but it's not choreographed because we can't remember. Hmm. So it's improvised, uh-huh. and we talk to each got other it. through the whole thing. Got so you got to be in shape. you got to look like you're really fighting. I mean, come on. I slam you in the head with a chair five times, and you <laughs> don't go down, or you make this miraculous comeback. Uh, put that guy, bring that one guy who I hit in the, with a chair five times, and got up and beat me, bring him to Afghanistan, and the war will be done in three days. <laughs> you know, but people like that because it's television. Mm-hmm. It's, it's entertainment. Mm-hmm. You really think Chuck Norris can do what he does in the movies or Steven Seagal or anything? They're movie stars. They're not real. I mean, they were real fighters back then. But Chuck Norris, he's the nicest guy in the world. Okay? But he's not as dangerous as people think. You know, he can defend himself, he can protect himself and his family, but more people are scared of his reputation than who he really is Hmm. because of the movies. You know, and you know, it it, sometimes when people meet celebrities, they have a different, you know, way, and that's the whole thing of like the afterglow. You know, they got to see the girls from 30 years ago, how they are now. And how they love their fans still, and how the fans still love them, and it was it was crazy. The Afterglow fan party it was absolutely nuts. <laughs> how they interacted with each other, and how these fans are like rabid fans. They're they're stronger than WWE fans or mm-hmm. professional boxing or kickboxing or MMA uh, because they really care about their uh, their fans. Yeah, they're and, most you know, loyal to 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 30 years. Mm. You know, I can't remember what I did 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, we've got to invite uh, Di on the uh, next cruise, Dan. Can you fill her in on uh, the one uh, coming up uh, in February? Uh, yeah, there's, there's one coming in February. Uh, it's the Afterglow's, Afterglow uh, Fan Party. Uh, it's also an 80s thing. It's a seven-day cruise. Uh, it's leaving New Orleans, but I think it's going to the Bahamas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's the fan party. They have a disco night. They have a, a uh, karaoke thing. They have a scavenger hunt. And all the girls have different things. And you know, every night there's dinner, and the guys get to sit with, you know, guys and girls get to sit with the glow girls, and the, they just interact. And they have a blast. And it's really funny because, you know, I'm not a social person, <laughs> you know. And if they would go up to Roxy and go, can we walk up to Dan? He won't kill us, will he? <laughs> and it's like, uh, no, he won't kill you. And I was really <laughs> nice to them. They were like, they were like uh, Diana Prince, uh, we picked her up to bring her to the Queen Mary. And when she got in the car, Johnny C was in the car. She was all excited because Roxy Astor picked her up and, Johnny C was in the back sitting with her, and she she said to Roxy at the thing, she goes, when I got in the car, I saw Dan, because I always heard about him, but I saw him. She goes, I was scared to death. <laughs> and I was like, what were you scared of? She goes, I didn't know if you were going to just kill me or if I said something stupid or something. I was like, no, I, you know, nothing bothers me. You know, we, me and, me and Roxy have a, a signal. She does most of the talking and does things and all that, and I just sit and stare at somebody. And if it doesn't go Roxy's way, she looks at me and goes, okay, sick him. <laughs> and then I do what I do best, you know, because I just stare at people, and I make people feel really uncomfortable. But that's the job of a bodyguard. I'm not there to be a friend. I'm not even the friends with the people I bodyguard. Hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, my job is to protect them. You know, people don't realize bodyguards, what we're doing is the number thing they do in personal protection uh, is to get them out of there. Mm-hmm. Not to beat up the person or start a fight or take it, is to get them out of there. You know, and yes. I use my body as a shield. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know. Have you ever, you were talking about some of the women, have you ever been, other than Roxy, have you ever been threatened or felt felt threatened? By a woman. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. Uh, I once time was working security at a bar, and a guy started a fight, and I grabbed him. He was going to beat up one of my bartenders. Mm. I grabbed him and put him in an arm lock and put him down, and his girlfriend grabbed a Jack Daniels bottle and hit me in the head. Oh, my oh, God. If you know anything oh. about Jack Daniels bottles, they don't break. Oh, Oh. If it were broke, it would have been better. I got 23 oh. stitches in my head. Oh. oh, my gosh. I saw it coming at the last second and moved, and it grazed me, but the bottle ripped my head open. I've got oh. a wicked scar on the top of my head, 23 stitches long. And uh, she went to hit me again, and I grabbed her arm, and I punched her in the face. <laughs> uh, and people went, so. and she had a, yeah, it's like, you know, I'm not into beating men or beating women, but if you're getting attacked, it's a human being attacking you. Mm-hmm. You know. With and, a foreign uh, object, you know, too. Yes, yeah, exactly. you know, so uh, one thing, women are nastier than guys. <laughs> guys fight almost by a set of rules. Very mm-hmm. loose rule, rules. Rules. Yes. Mm-hmm. Women don't fight with the rules. That's why you hear some guys go, you fight like a girl. I mean, back when I took karate, if I threw a kick, I would kick somebody. I would kick, if we were out in the street, I would kick somebody in the head and they go, you fight like a girl, you use your kicks. Huh? That makes no sense. <laughs> Nowadays, it's karate, but back then, no one knew what really karate was. So if you kick, only girls kick. Because guys fist fight. You know? Yeah. It's just you know, the way of the world now. Yeah. I've often thought that that we fight very dirtily and uh, say it that way. Um, and also, and you're right about the rules. We and you know what? Interestingly enough, that also applies to the way women interact with each other. Hmm. We yeah. we don't we don't do it by a set of rules. You just never know how a woman is going to react to you, another woman. It's very interesting, but you're absolutely right about that. 
Hmm. Well, you know, I always say women are on the nastiest fighters. Men are normally taught to protect. So, you know, it's not in our DNA, but it's just in our culture, no matter what culture you come from, the male is supposed to protect and the female is Hmm. supposed to, you know, comfort and all that. But in my seminars, I will actually take a woman and say, okay, I need a volunteer, a woman. Uh, one preferably that has kids. And I get one up and I go, so how old are your kids? Oh, well, they're three and one's seven. Okay, I want you to close your eyes and just listen to my voice. Okay, and she'll close her eyes and I'll go, I have your seven-year-old right next to me. And mm-hmm. I just grabbed her arm and I'm slapping her in the face. And she's crying out for you. But I'm not going to let her scream anymore. Oh. I've got my hand over her mouth. And I'm pulling her hair back to shut her up. And uh, everybody will look at the woman's face, and her eyes are closed, and you can see her whole body just tensing up, tensing up and look like she's shaking. And then I say, when I tell you to open your eyes, you hit the first thing that you see. And I'll be standing there with a pad. And when she opens her eyes, she hits that pad so damn hard that if she hit me, she would have killed me. Hmm. And it takes me usually 10 minutes to calm that person down. Because they're shaking, and because I got their adrenaline going. Mm-hmm. But women mm-hmm. are more protective than men are. It's just that, again, it's culture. We're always taught men are more stronger. Let me tell you something. From the hips down, men and women are the same. We have the same muscles, everything, except for the private parts. Mm-hmm. But the only difference between women and men, basically, is from the private parts up to, you know, the neck. A woman can't take the same punishment a man can. And it's because women can give birth. If when I was fighting, if you hit me in the side and you hit me in the kidney or hit me in the liver, you could bruise it, you know, and hurt it. But Mm -hmm. if I hit a woman in the same area near the liver or the kidney, I can move her liver and kidney all the way up her chest. Hmm. Because a woman's internal organs move when they get pregnant. A man's Mm -hmm. Internal sure. organs don't move. Mm. Our internal organs don't move. That's why when you ever hear there's accidents, women die more of internal injuries than guys do. Oh, 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 oh. oh. And it's people not it, just knowing that. I took, I have a degree in kinesiology, which is the study of muscles. Mm-hmm. And most people that have that degree, you know, become masseuse or physical therapist. I did it to learn how to hurt people better. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go to a I can't go to a chiropractor and get my neck cracked because I can take my hand in the same position and kill you. Mm. And when they put their hand my, that position on my head, I start to sweat and freak out. Mm. And I go, "Look, mm. you can't do this." Oh no, I'm real. I'll be real. I'm sorry. I can kill you with the same move. Mm. So no, you mm. can't do it. So it's all you know. Everything you do in life is just based on what your mindset is. And my mindset is basically never give up, never quit, you know, uh, till you're dead. Mm. And the only thing people are scared of me is dead might not stop me. <laughs> I tell you what, I have learned a lot from you in this conversation. Mm-hmm. I really have a lot of things I've never thought about before. And didn't know. I, I, it's just been very interesting talking with you. I have to say. Yeah, Dan. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you are a wealth the of knowledge. About it's it. Same thing. <laughs> I, I echo those sentiments. Yeah. Well, the thing that, that people don't understand, you know, like I just made you more aware. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem, though. You go through a paranoid stage now. Now you become hyper aware, <laughs> but it's now you got to. And people get upset with that. They go, "Now I'm so aware. I'm scared to go to anywhere." It's like, okay, well, you got to keep practicing until eventually you get used to it. Mm-hmm. It's like if you've never worked out before, the first day you work out, the next day you're dying. Mm-hmm. You know, now you got to figure out whether you want to continue on or not. Mm-hmm. Well, the same thing goes with personal protection or self-defense or everything. You know, uh, you have to practice. You have to get used to it. I have a little bit of an advantage because my line of work puts me in dangerous situations that are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I do stupid stuff <laughs> all on account of it's my job mm-hmm. because I wanted to know what it felt like. I don't recommend anybody does that. And people go, 
Can I, will I learn to defend myself like you? No, you won't. Will you learn to run away like me? Hopefully, if you're smart. <laughs> but, look, Dan, you won't run away. I won't run away if my family's involved or I'm getting paid. Mm-hmm. My family's involved. If you do anything to my family, I will hunt you down. And I will rent out a, a warehouse. And I will torture you for a week. <laughs> you'll, be on the brink, you'll be on the brink of death, and I'll help you and heal you so I can do it again. That's like uh, sounds like Liam Neeson what, from Taken. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> I love that movie. I had I had a girl who's a singer who I bodyguard, and she was like, her dad paid for me to bodyguard her, and she was supposed to do a European tour, and mm-hmm. she was going to go to Germany. Well, that's where they did the whole thing of Taken, and mm-hmm. her dad freaked out. And said, "You're not going there unless Dan goes with you." I'm like, <laughs> She's not going to get taken. That movie was so ridiculous. They don't go after Americans. <laughs> you know, they will not. They will not. No matter what they think of how cute they are, they will not go after Americans. Mm. Mm. They will go after you know the other Europeans. They will not go after Americans. Mm-hmm. But it's a great movie to watch. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But see, someone like me, who's been in the business, I criticize that movie. Mm-hmm. You see, you both have seen the movie, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I didn't see oh, it. Oh, you haven't seen it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you one short little thing. Remember, Liam Nielsen had these other three guys that they were a member of, a, like, a SEAL team, right? And they were protecting the singer. Mm-hmm. How come when his daughter got kidnapped, the other three guys didn't come with him? Huh. Hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> was, yeah, I was like, wait a minute. The three, the, there was four of you to protect the singer. You got your daughter got kidnapped in Germany, and you got all these tools. Why didn't you bring three other guys that knew better just as much as you did? <laughs> that would have made too much sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, would have been, you wouldn't have had the movie been as much that way. Yeah, the movie would have been over in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you'll have to see that movie, Die. It's a great, uh, really great film. Um Seriously, uh, it is. Very, yes, I, I highly recommend. It. It's probably hard for Dan to watch it from with his eyes. Yeah. Uh, you know. Oh well, no, I I love watching Taken. The mm-hmm. the movie I love the best is uh, I, Man on Fire. Oh yes, uh, with yeah. Denzel Washington mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I've been yeah. to Juarez, Mexico. I have worked in Juarez, Mexico, oh, yeah. and that a lot of stuff that happened there that happened in the movie does happen. Kidnappings happen all the time over there. Now, there's the only thing that was ridiculous in my eyes was, uh, no matter how good you're trained, uh, you can't get away with doing all that stuff. <laughs> you know, it doesn't it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it makes a great movie. Yeah, that's another good one, Die. Definitely check that out. But um, <laughs> well, Dan, listen, um, I can't believe it. Already an hour has flown by oh so gosh. fast. Yeah, I mean that went by so quickly. Oh I can't believe it. Yeah, and um. I want to thank you so much for being on here, and uh, also Di, of course, uh, co-hosting and uh, you know being able to be on the podcast as well. Dan, I truly enjoyed it, and I'm really glad that you got connected with Di, and we'll definitely have to trade some contact information so that way you guys can uh, sure. get in touch with each well, you other. You guys are gonna have to go to the uh, after go party thing so we Certainly. can meet up. Certainly, absolutely. And you know what? I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm looking forward to it, and you know, like I said, you know, I like one. I like the cruises. Yeah, and two, it, it just amazes me. You know, like here's the thing: they did the after cruise, all these fans, and then they announced the afterglow cruise in February on the cruise. And if they did it before they got off the cruise, they get a better discount. Ten cabins were sold that night. Yeah, I was I like, believe it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's ten months away. You know, <laughs> uh, when I when they were saying it, I'm like. They're not going to get anybody to sign up. <laughs> Ten people signed up right then and there. Uh, Roxy's almost got 20 cabins sold already. It's crazy. Yeah, you know what, you know? Uh, Di, I'll fill you in on it more uh, because uh, I know you probably haven't uh, checked it out, but I'll uh, give you some insight. You definitely got to go. Sure. Uh, we got some time, <laughs> definitely, but like Dan was saying, you got to check it out. Um, you're going to enjoy it. And that also leaves me on another note, too, before I forget, Dan. Um, if Roxy's still there with you, I definitely want Di to meet her, and maybe we could set her up for one of these interviews uh, for our next I'll podcast go as right well. Now? 
Sure. Yeah. Why? You know right what? Next? Yeah. Die. Uh, die. Meet Roxy. Uh, Roxy. Meet oh. Die. Hold on one minute. Yeah. Perfect. Hello. Roxy, this is Die Chapman. Die. This is Roxy Astor. Hi, Roxy. Hi. How are you? Fine. We were just hearing a lot about you. A lot of have, only the good well, things. She was busy. You were busy looking at your phone. I understand. <laughs> so maybe you didn't hear that. But no, I, yeah. I was in the shower, so oh. I missed it. <laughs> so if there's anything good you want to talk about me, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Um, I was just telling Dan that we want to have you on uh, for the next podcast. So uh, let's touch base. I want to find out what your schedule's like. We'll sync up with Die. Die. Let's find out what your schedule's like. Let's get Roxy on the next podcast with us, please. Sounds good. Sounds good. good. Awesome. Yeah. All right. We, we got to get her on this cruise. Yeah, that's what I we're, want we, it. We, she will be there. Okay. We're, we're going to have her. I'm already speaking for her. She's on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Seriously, Die. I'll fill you in. Though. You hear that? Because we're going to have an 80s prom. So I, I told all the, uh, the cruisers if you were the wallflower at your prom, you will no longer uh, be that wallflower. <laughs> <laughs> and it's during. It's during the worst holiday of the year, Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Di, you're going to have a blast. I'll give you the information. I'll forward it to you um, so you can check it you out. Know, anything yeah. that's got an 80s vibe going on, yep. I just love. So. Ah, there, well, there oh, you no, go. I'm yes, going to be doing, yes. I'm doing shoulder pads. Ratting uh-huh. my hair out, glitter, uh-huh. <laughs> and pop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. Oh, all my right. Goodness. Nice to meet you. Here's Dan again. Thanks, I'll Roxy. Appreciate it. Yes. All right, all right Roxy. Too. Take Bye. care. Well, Dan, listen, uh, thanks yeah. again. We'll let you go. Uh, again, really appreciate your time. Let's have you back on here very soon. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough. And I'm so happy that uh, we got you back on here. And uh, we'll be in touch very soon and get you back on for the next episode to talk more about the cruise coming up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. you. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. For Dan Magnus, for Di Chapman, this is Taryn Traveling Trainer saying we're signing off. And everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Taryn. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. All right, folks, there you have it, Mr. Dan Magnus, all the way from Los Angeles, California, returning here on GoTerran TV. Wonderful interview with that gentleman. I want to thank him very much for being on here. And, Dan, this invitation is always extended to you. Let's get you back on for yet another episode of GoTerran TV. But that will wrap up Episode 499 today. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I also want to thank Ms. Di Chapman for being right here on GoTerran TV as the new co-host right here and I want to say I know I said earlier that it was kind of an informal casual soft opening if you will with having her on here today with me but officially we're going to welcome her on episode 501 next week don't miss out on that she's got some awesome guests lined up just for you I'm so excited about that now in between that of course like I just said today was episode 499 we've got 501 next week well this coming Friday July the 1st We've got the special episode 500 with our mystery guest, and I won't, I won't spoil it. I'm not going to tell you right here because I don't want to ruin the surprise. you just got to stay tuned on Friday, July 1st, to Go Taren. The ways to do that is to please make sure to like Go Taren on Facebook, subscribe to Go Taren on YouTube, and follow Go Taren on Twitter, and that will keep you connected with yours truly, Taren the Traveling Trainer, master of the personal training universe, now with co-host Ms. Di Chapman. And remember that GoTerran Personal Training is your time, your investment, and your life. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you this Friday, July 1st, on Episode 500, everybody. Bye-bye.